So with house rules out of the way, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Adam Lucas. The Dr. Lucas is a senior lecturer in science and technology studies in the School of Humanities and Social Inquiry at the University of Wollongong. He has extensive experience in government, governance and policy development, and is particularly interested in processes of technological and organisational innovation with a strong commitment to social and environmental justice. On a personal note, Adam is also one of my lecturers as well as doing my undergraduate degree at URW. And I have to say that some of my favorite subjects were the ones that Adam taught. And I'm really glad that he agreed to work with us for this very important topic. So without further ado, over to you, Adam. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you to Wollongong Library for organizing this talk today. So hello, everybody. And thank you all for coming today. Greetings from Wadi Wadi country in Lake Illawarra, which is where I am here in Primby. So today I'm going to try to summarise some of the research that I've been doing over the last few years into covert influence on government policy by the fossil fuel industry here in Australia. So the presentation I'm giving you today puts together research that's been done by the Australia Institute, the Australian Conservation Foundation, GetUp, Market Forces and the Centre for Public Integrity. And it also draws on a database of current, uh, of 160 current and former politicians, political staffers and senior bureaucrats who have employment links to the fossil fuel and resource extraction industries. And that research covers the period from 2007 to 2021. So that's going to form the, part, the last part of my presentation today. There are a lot of charts and graphs because that's a simple way to present a lot of complex information for you. And I'll also make my slides available for you uh, if anybody wants them after the talk. So what I'm going to cover is just give you a bit of international context about the climate change counter movement. Give you a bit of an overview of how political influence works by corporations and the kinds of undemocratic outcomes that arise from it. So I'm going to focus on lobbying, political donations, tax avoidance, and my own work on the revolving door between the fossil fuel industry, senior politicians, bureaucrats and political staffers, and then some concluding, I guess, recommendations arising from this research. So I'm sure that most of you would be aware that fossil fuels are responsible for around 60% of historic greenhouse gas emissions and more than 65% of current emissions, so two thirds. Uh, the industry is no, has known about the potential for climate disruption from its activities since the early 80s. But instead of accepting the science and transforming its business model over the last 40 years, it's actively sought to undermine climate science research and to oppose any climate or energy policy proposals which threaten its incumbency. So since the 80s, it's been actively involved in building a multi-scalar network of interest coalitions and these coalitions are directly opposed to the goals of the international environmental movement. And in the US, this has been dubbed the climate change counter movement. It mostly consists of transnational corporations in the fossil fuel, mining, transport, automotive and metals processing sectors. It uses a variety of strategies and it's been largely successful in shaping government decision making in many countries, including here in Australia, as you'll see. So in terms of the undemocratic outcomes of corporate political influence more generally, you're seeing this is particularly opaque. Uh, most of us as members of the public don't know or have access to this information, what's going on. You're also seeing growing secrecy around major government decision making processes where these corporations have got a direct involvement. There's a lack of transparency and accountability from governments with respect to large government expenditures and uh, they hide behind this term commercial in confidence, even though this is public money that's being spent. We've also seen funding and staffing cuts to government oversight and regulatory bodies, the Bureau of Statistics, the Tax Office, ASIC, the ACCC, ICAC here in New South Wales and in the other states, the EPAs and so on. As a result of these activities, this clearly undermines trust not just in public institutions, but in private institutions as well. It also undermines notions of democracy. We see increasingly ideologically narrow public debates concerning important policy issues 
and as a result of this, poorly informed publics and bad public policy. Uh, one of the things I'm going to focus on is massive corporate tax avoidance, particularly in relation to the fossil fuel industry. And as a result of this, the inability of governments to adequately fund health, education, social welfare and other key government responsibilities. So the strategies that they engage in to influence political, uh, to influence government, uh, these are the things I'm going to focus on today. So I'm not going to talk to all the things in white, the things in yellow are the things that I'm going to focus on. So corporate lobbying of senior politicians and bureaucrats, corporate political donations to major political parties, revolving door appointments between governments and powerful corporations, and what I've called the golden escalator for former senior public officials entering into the private sector. Now, this obviously doesn't just apply to the fossil fuel industry, it applies to all areas of government policy where large expenditure is involved. So pharmaceuticals, healthcare, aged care, gaming and racing, finance industry, banking, and so on. Now, just to give you a bit of background about the distorted perception that many Australians have about mining and resources industry, this is the results of an Australia Institute survey done 10 years ago. The average of the respondents uh, was that they thought that mining contributed 35% of GDP, that it employed 16% of the workforce, and that mining assets were 53% foreign owned. The reality was that mining contributed 9% of GDP that financial year, which was then a 100 year record. I mean, it has got to similar levels uh, in the last few years, and it's probably up around 10 or 11%. So again, uh, that's you know still a record compared to 2010-11, uh, to but still, you know, that's not been uh, the, uh, the norm. The mining industry only employs 2% of the workforce that year, probably pretty much the same uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, mining assets are 83% foreign owned. So let's have a look in a bit more detail at lobbying and lobbyists. It's a billion dollar business. Uh, estimates of expenditure by Australian peak bodies and advocacy groups. So it's not just in fossil fuels, but this is across the board. For that financial year, 2015-16, ranged from 400 to 700 million dollars. So that's just a single year. The investigative journalist Michael West has found that 20 of Australia's major business lobbies spent almost 2 billion on lobbying between 2014 and 2017. Research from the US from 2009 found that for every $1 spent, the return on investment can be as high as $220. I mean, I've seen figures of as much as 20,000% uh, in terms of returns on lobbying expenditure. Now, for those of you who know about it, there's a book by Cameron Fritters, uh, Cameron Murray rather, and Paul Fritters called Game of Mates, where they go through a number of these different industries and how this this kind of activity occurs here in Australia in different portfolio areas. It's thoroughly recommended if you haven't read it already. Another study by US economists found that 65% of Australia's billionaires owe their wealth to political favours as opposed to 1% in the United States. That's, you know, it's comparable to here in Australia to Colombia and India. In terms of federal government lobbying, in uh, this time last year, federal lobbyist register recorded there were 571 lobbyists working in Canberra. Uh, a year earlier, there were far more, 884 lobbyists working for 279 firms on behalf of almost 3,700 clients. Of the ones in that 2020 uh, record, more than 200 were former government representatives, and that included 25 former politicians and more than 40 former political staffers who'd worked for ministers. Now, the actual number of federal lobbyists is more like 2,400 because a lot of them don't have to actually, they actually work for companies. So they, they're kind of a different category and don't have to go onto the register. But that means that there's more than 10 lobbyists for each of the 227 current members of federal parliament. And this is work that Hannah Orby for the Australia Institute did, and she was showing the, that the mining industry spent $540 million on lobbying governments through peak industry bodies over that 10-year period. So you can see the peak of it was in that 2011-2012 election where Abbott won. And this shows you the same work from uh, Hannah, showing you how much uh, revenue went to these peak uh, lobbying bodies 
for the minerals industry. And I think that's pretty plain, so I don't need to go over that with you any more detail. This comes from some of the work that I've been doing. So this shows you nine lobbying firms with fossil energy clients and former politicians in their employ. So this is the number of former politicians and these are the lobbying firms. This shows you lobbying firms and consultancies with fossil energy clients and the number of positions held by current or former political staffers and senior bureaucrats. So obviously there's a lot more of them, but again, you can see that there's a handful of lobbying companies that have a large number of former uh, political staffers and senior bureaucrats in them. If I couldn't work out what the politi party political uh, affiliation of these people were, they went into the indeterminate category. But you can see there's a lot more coalition-linked people than there are Labor, but there's still quite a lot of Labor people. This shows you the total number of positions in lobbying firms and consultancies that are occupied by current and former politicians, staffers and senior bureaucrats. So this is aggregating all of those figures and showing you that Government Relations Australia, GRA Everingham, GRA Causeway, three affiliated lobbying firms, they're the biggest numbers. Endeavour Consulting, ECG Advisory is another big one, and there's four or five others. Now, most of these have got some kind of links or they were founded by former politicians. Uh, this shows you how much indirect subsidies have been paid to the fossil fuel industry over that six year period up to this year. And you can see that the amounts have increased substantially so it's more than 70 billion over six years and that's from work that market forces has done now this is for the whole country it's not just federal but a lot of these subsidies are coming from the federal government so now let's have a look at political donations to the major parties by the fossil energy and resource industries so some of you would have known this work that's been done by the acf and center for public integrity uh, and uh, work of one of the Sue Edwards at UNSW. Almost two thirds of major party revenue sources remain undisclosed to this date. And there's a billion dollars over 20 years that we don't know where it's come from. Now, given that these resource extraction industries is most highly capitalized and they have the most to gain from influencing policy, you can be fair, we can be fairly sure that a lot of that money has come from them indirectly. But this shows you disclosed donations to the major parties from the resource sector uh, up to 2016. And again, this is work that Hannah Orby did for the Australian Institute. So you can see again, Liberal and National, blue and yellow, they're the predominant in each of these figures. And you know, this is, uh, you know, just before a, um, an election. Labor is getting money, but not nearly as much as the coalition. Hannah also made a point of looking at, well, when, when these spikes occurred, that they, they correlate either to important policy announcements or attempts to get policy through, or with elections. Again, I won't dwell on this because uh, I think it's fairly obvious what's going on there. So this shows you top 10 fossil fuel political donors and donees in Australia, 2016-17. So you'll again, brown for uh, the nationals, red for Labor, blue for Liberals. And you can see here again, there's a, in a few cases, Labor is getting a bit more, or it's getting most, the Liberal Party, and major players that we know about, Whitehaven, the Minerals Council, Chevron, Santos, Origin, Woodside. This is from work from the Australian Conservation Foundation based on AEC data, and this is for the year afterwards. You might know St Baker Family Trust has got links to the Liberal Party, major donor. He got, he got a concession on one of the Hunter Valley coal-fired power stations for a dollar or something like that, I think it happened. Uh, Woodside Energy is donating almost as much labour and you can see here labour is getting more money from some of these big oil and gas companies. 
and that also comes out in some more stats I'll show you shortly. This is aggregated figures for political donors from the fossil fuel industry. So again, you know, some of the usual suspects, Caltex, Adani, the Minerals Council, Blue Scope, Origin, Mineral Resources, Gene Reinhardt, Chevron, Santos, Woodside, a big contributor. But also these are big companies that are extracting lots of gas. So in terms of uh, where the money is flowing relative to the gas industry and the coal industry, this is again from work that the ACF has done, showing us that Labor has predominantly been getting funding from the gas industry and the coal industry has been predominantly funding the Liberals. So that's just for one, uh, that's since 2015 financial year, so that's up to 2020. So how is this all playing out in terms of tax avoidance? Well, how much revenue should we be getting from the fossil and energy resource uh, and energy and resource industries? Well, if Kevin Rudd had been successful in getting the re resource super profits tax through before he was rolled, uh, we would be looking at 60 billion over that eight year period. Uh, estimates of the tax avoided by the fossil energy and resource sectors, 60 to 100 billion over that 10 year period. Another thing which you all should know is that the mining industry routinely conflates its royalties with its tax payments to mislead the public about its contributions to the economy. Of course, royalties are not taxes. They're a fee paid to Australian citizens for the privilege of exploiting our natural resources. So in terms of revenue uh, generated by the fossil fuel exports, the whole sector generated almost 115 billion just in uh, the last financial year from its Australian operations. That was a bit less than what it had generated in the previous financial year of 132 billion. Uh, if put that into some context, our GDP in 2019-20 was almost $2 trillion. So the fossil fuel industry contributed about 6% of GDP, which is pretty much a historical record and 30% of all export revenue in 2019-20. So you can see why the fossil fuel industry is so determined to get to exert influence over the major political parties. So over the 15 year period up to 2020, the largest fossil export earner was coal. The total coal export revenue was more than 643 billion. The total gas export revenue was more than 287 billion and the total petroleum export revenue was at more than 166 billion. So as a percentage of nominal GDP, the last few years have seen record levels of coal export revenue, and that's comparable only to the recent boom years from 08 to 2012. But export revenues from gas are historically unprecedented, as you can see in this graph. So this shows you, this is um, uh, from the tax office, and uh, this shows you uh, sorry, it's from Bureau of Statistics, I think maybe it's from the tax office, I can't remember. But this does show you fluctuations in the coal revenue. Natural gas, you can just see it's been going exponential. Uh, but even comparing this, you know, this is the previous previous boom years, right? So more coal being exported uh, than ever before, far more natural gas than ever before. And the other categories you can see are somewhat in decline or flatlining. Now, another thing that a lot of people don't know is that the big four accountancy firms are enablers of tax avoidance throughout the world for all corporations, but including the fossil fuel industry. And they've helped the industry to avoid paying tens of billions of dollars in income taxes and royalties for publicly owned fossil fuel resources over many, many years. The big four are responsible for auditing 98% of global corporations with a turnover of US 1 billion or more. They've reputedly cost governments and taxpayers globally US $1 trillion in annual revenue. Uh, over that six year period to 2018, 13 of the big four's largest Australian clients in the industry generated $160 billion in revenue but paid $12 million in income tax, 0.007% of total revenue. 2015 to 18, the 10 most responsible clients generated 415 billion in total revenue and paid 21 billion in income tax or 5% of total revenue. 
This shows you the major greenhouse gas emitters and the top 15 corporations, AGL, Energy Australia, Origin, CS Energy. Again, you can see your usual suspects, Santos, Rio Tinto. Well, funnily enough, they also appear in terms of, even though these are the top resource and energy taxpayers, they're still not paying a great deal of tax, as you can see. So Rio Tinto's there, Woodside Petroleum, Alcoa, AGL, 5% average across those companies. Energy Australia paid zero income tax, ExxonMobil, Santos. You can see the huge revenues that these companies are generating, but the tax structure is such, with the help of the big four, that they are paying hardly any tax. But this is based on Michael West's deep dive into corporate tax avoidance. Okay, so revolving door. I mean, I can see I'm already at 20 minutes, so I'm going to kind of rush through a bit of this stuff. But this shows you party political donations, uh, affiliations of 38 current and former ALP and coalition politicians. So again, it's predominantly coalition. This shows you the jurisdictions in which these politicians had served. So predominantly federal, but also New South Wales, Queensland, and somewhat surprisingly, South Australia. This shows you the ministerial positions that these politicians filled. So it's primarily Minister for State or Regional Development. This is the states and territories, premiers, state deputy premiers, attorney generals, minister for energy, minister for industry, minister for trade. These are the federal ministerial position, uh, uh, positions that were filled by these politicians. So minister for resources, energy, industry, defense, trade, assistant treasurer, and even treasurers and deputy prime ministers. This shows you the federal and state ministers post political employment as lobbyists, consultants and board members as for fossil fuel firms. So a lot of them are going into board positions, lobbying and in consultancies. This shows you the fossil fuel companies and peak industry bodies for which former politicians filled board positions. So you can see they've got a good spread there, even though there's not a lot of them, there's a lot of spread. This shows you the political party allegiances of almost 120 ministerial staff as the senior bureaucrats who are employed by the fossil fuel firms and peak industry bodies. So again, you've got about half of them a coalition, about a third couldn't work out oh, you know, what their party political affiliations were, guns for hire if you like. This shows you the state and federal jurisdictions in which most of those people were employed. And of course, you know, these are the major fossil fuel producing states and federally. That's for the coalition. This is for Labor, pretty much similar. So to finish up, what should we be doing about this stuff? I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about these issues. So I'm just kind of bringing together this stuff and putting it to you here. So first of all, we need to ban large political donations to political parties and candidates and increase the transparency over donations, including real-time reporting of political donations, or we go to completely publicly funded elections with election expenditure limits. We need to require the registration of all lobbyists and, and the details of who's meeting with our elected representatives and the general topics discussed. We need to strengthen freedom of information laws and whistleblower protection laws. We need to mandate three to five year cooling off periods for public officials on taking jobs in related portfolios after leaving public office. And I guess most importantly, we need to create an independent watchdog to investigate and stamp out corruption, a federal ICAC or Integrity Commission. So there's a bit of further reading. And I, as I said, I'll make these slides available. This is stuff about Australia. I'm sure most of you or some of you at least will know some of these uh, books. And here are some internationally orientated ones. So that's it for me. And um, let's go to questions and hopefully I can get my screen to work properly. Oh, here we go. Is that working? Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. And I'll make sure you're in the spotlight there so everyone can see you. Uh, so we did have one question in the chat. Um, uh, how do we fix the system? Uh, so obviously you've got some recommendations there, um, but I'm thinking like for, for me also, I would add to that like um, 
where you're saying to like ban large donations to political parties, how likely is that to happen? Like, how do we actually make these changes occur? Well, a lot of a lot of um, legislation has been brought before the federal parliament to do this kind of thing. You probably know Helen Haynes has been trying to get federal ICAC legislation up, which is supported by the crossbenchers and Labor. And uh, it's really just a matter. She's trying to get that through the Senate, through Rex Patrick at the moment, and she's going to reintroduce it into the lower house. I think she said next week. So that's around a federal ICAC around political donations. I mean, again, there's been efforts made by the Greens and some of the independents to get legislation up. Um, but I mean, really, ultimately, it's up to us as citizens to take some responsibility for this and get politically involved and engaged and to be writing to our politicians, getting involved in political campaigning, supporting the parties that we prefer and supporting the candidates that we prefer so that we can see some genuine reform actually happening. I mean, as far as making the renewable energy transition is concerned, I mean, we've seen a lot of initiatives being uh, pushed at the state and territory level, and that's all very good. And you would probably all know that Matt Keane, who's the uh, now treasurer and had been, uh, has been pushing hard for uh, a lot of positive renewable energy um, policies, but you know, if those of you who are interested in reading my paper will see, uh, there's lots of other areas of energy policy in which both Labor and the Coalition have not been active in pushing for reform. And that's around a whole range of different issues. Um, so, you know, there's, there's the visibility of the renewable energy sector, which uh, on, on the surface, Labor seems to be pushing some good policies uh, and certainly at the state level, both moderate liberal governments and Labor governments have been, you know, picking up the slack where the federal government has totally dropped the ball. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's possible to get there. It's just that we have a government in power at the moment that uh, consists largely of climate change deniers and have been dragging their heels on committing to any policy. And here we are like a week before the Glasgow climate talks and they still don't even have a policy to take. Um, we do have another question as well in the chat. If Australia did somehow stop our coal exports, you know, let's say on January 1st next year, uh, what could we possibly replace that 30% of our exports with? Well, that's a that's an absurd argument because nobody's ever said that we should immediately stop coal exports. What needs to happen, and this should have been happening 10 years ago, is there should have been policy implemented across the board, bipartisan, to phase out coal mining. Now, this needs to happen over a 10 to 15 year period. It can't be immediately switched off. Nobody in the environmental movement or anybody else who's got any sense has ever said that it should happen uh, immediately, although that is in fact how uh, the proponents of the fossil fuel industry within both major parties have represented any criticism of phasing out exports. So we also need to be putting in, in plans for a just transition. Now this is something that has been discussed a lot more recently, even here in New South Wales. So that is encouraging, but we still don't see any concrete policy proposals from either of the major parties to make that happen. Now, Labor claims that it's got a just transition policy. Where are the details? I mean, there obviously this, um, this push for green hydrogen that does present uh, a lot of job opportunities. The renewable energy industry and manufacturing Components for the renewable energy industry will generate jobs. Uh, energy efficiency measures will generate jobs. Retrofitting houses and other buildings will generate lots of jobs. It's a matter of the federal government, whoever is in power, uh, you know, showing some leadership and actually working in a cooperative fashion with business, industry, the universities, the unions, the TAFE colleges, to train people, to put in place adequate training measures, to put in place um, policies which will allow workers in the fossil fuel industry to retrain, 
for this, these kinds of jobs. And if these people in the industry uh, are unwilling or unable to retrain, then giving them enough money that they can retire on comfortably. I mean, the amount of money that we throw at the fossil fuel industry is absurd, you know, given how profitable it is and given how much revenue that these companies generate, we are not getting a fair go from them. And, the, and this is basically both the coalition and Labor have collaborated to not impose, uh, you know, higher royalties and taxes on these companies. So one has got to wonder what is going on here, you know, and the evidence that I've presented to you, I think it shows pretty clearly that they infiltrated the major political parties, they've infiltrated our bureaucracies, they've got political staffers going from their own companies into, into um, working for ministers. And uh, in this way, they're able to shape government policy to their advantage. Thank you so much for sharing that, Adam. Um, if anyone's got any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat there. Um, I can see Lara has also just shared um, a survey that we have available if uh, anyone wanted to share their thoughts and and oh there we go and we've just got the QR code come up there as well now um, so if anyone does have any feedback on the talk uh, we really appreciate hearing what you all have to say and of course any other questions uh, but uh, here we go we've got uh, I think there's just a lot of a conversation going on uh, in the chat which is great to see um, everyone getting involved in uh, sort of sharing a, um, a few different ideas about how we can go about um, addressing this, because as we've seen, it uh, is kind of a big problem <laughs> to put it uh, to put it bluntly. Um, a question there from uh, Clancy asking, Adam, uh, what would you like for the Prime Minister to present at COP26? <laughs> what would I like him to present? I'd like him to present um... A number of different things. Have you got an hour? <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, it's pretty obvious that we need to radically improve our commitment to reducing emissions and not to 2000 below 2005 levels, but 1990 levels, you know, and it's just cheating trying to use 2005 levels as a basis for reducing emissions. And they should be increased. They should be going for a renewable energy target for for 2030. I mean, really, I mean, we could easily get to 75% renewables by 2030, and 100% would not be uh, impossible. Phasing out fossil fuels is obviously something that should be happening, including our exports. We shouldn't be building any more coal mines. We shouldn't be opening any more gas wells. But you know, they're mesmerised by these rivers of gold which is supposedly flowing into government coffers, but as I've shown you, it's just getting exported overseas. So I mean, what is the rationale for exploiting these fossil fuel resources that we have if Australians are not benefiting from it? I and mean, I think it's just crazy. I mean, yeah, as I said, there's so many things that I would like Morrison and the Coalition to be taken to COP, but have we got an hour? <laughs> um, we do also have in the chat, that in your paper you describe this phenomenon as state capture rather than corruption um, yeah. and asking if you could elaborate on that a little bit please sure well state capture basically means that you've got private interests uh affecting government policy to the extent that their own interests are preferenced over it, the public interest or or really any other interests um you know there are formal definitions of what's meant by that but you know as as you would might, might have seen in this documentary that Craig Rucastle and Christiane Van Vuren put out for the ABC, when you can't call this corruption because it's legal. And so, yeah. and the Centre for Public Integrity has called it soft corruption. I, mean, I believe it's corrupt, you know, but, you know, to actually say this in a public uh, forum and accuse those who are involved of corruption, well, they'll probably get sued for defamation. So we also have very strong defamation laws here. <laughs> it's difficult to uh, point out individuals who might be involved in this kind of behaviour. Um, and our final question is, uh, where can we get your paper and the slides? Where can we access sure. this? Well, I'll, I'll give you a copy of both the paper and the slides, so you can distribute them to whoever would like them. Um, but my paper is actually behind a paywall, so it's not much point in me giving you a web link for it. Yeah. But I do have copies of it, which I can provide and happy. Wonderful. For anybody who's 
intended to to take and share them. Yeah, and everyone who's registered for this event, then we can actually we'll just send that out to those emails, um, so you can have uh, copies of that. Great, thank you, Mitchell, and thank you all for coming. And I hope you found that informative. And um, yeah, as I said, there's more detail in the paper, uh, and I present these arguments in a lot more, um, a lot more detail. Wonderful. Yes, thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, I hope you all have found this uh, as interesting as I have um, and that, you know, we've still got Global Climate Change Week is happening throughout the rest of the week. Um, check out the Wollongong City Library socials and we've got information on more events and talks happening. Uh, we've got that uh, survey link in the chat and again there on the QR code. Thank you so much for coming along and enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thanks, everybody. See you. Have a nice day.